Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray. The Savior who has already done so much for you remains eager to do more. Today he stands ready to hear your heartfelt concerns and your deep worries. He has promised to listen, to help, to strengthen and direct. May the Lord who has saved you from eternal death strengthen you in this life as well. God grant this grace to us all. Amen. Hollywood is obsessed with weddings. Movies, TVs, they, 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 there's something about it. You know, there's something about the drama of walking down the aisle, the commitment of saying I do, the cost of a great, luxurious reception, the antics of a bachelor or bachelorette party that keeps screenwriters scribbling and making, and moviegoers keep on coming back and paying. But Hollywood falls short when it comes to jaw-dropping wedding stories with twists. According to John's gospel, that honor belongs to Jesus, who delivers a shock. By miraculously providing wine for the wedding at Cana, Jesus did more than keep the party going, though, for those in attendance. He kicked off a wedding celebration so awesome that it has changed the world we live in and is still, in fact, ongoing today. John 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Wine held deep practical and spiritual significance for the Jewish partygoers of that wedding at Cana in Galilee. Practically, it did what wine does for us today. It fills the stomach, gladdens the heart, and it helps the mind drift from the matters that might hinder your efforts to relax, like at the wedding, a week-long Sabbath and celebration. But spiritually, scripturally, it, it serves as so much more. It, it served as a sign and symbol of the joy and blessing that flows from God's right hand into the hearts and lives of his chosen family. In Isaiah and Amos, the coming of the Messiah for eternity is shown by a feast, a, a celebration with an excess of wine. In Isaiah, we hear the promise that one day the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marl of aged wine well refined. Isaiah 25, 6. One day... We will enjoy a wedding feast to beat all other wedding feasts where God's forgiven people will celebrate their eternal resurrected life with him, with their love in Christ in their brand new home. Without wine at this wedding, which, which would have been the whole centerpiece of this feast, the celebration would have no doubt come to a grinding stop. Its absence leaving a bitter taste in the mouths of the guests and shame in the heart of the host. So in steps Jesus. At the request of his mother, Jesus makes sure the celebration does not cease. Filling six large stone water jars, Jesus performs his very first miracle, transforming some 150 gallons of water into an overflow of top shelf, aged to perfection, perfect party wine. Not the type of wine you can come out of a box or you can even buy in bulk at Costco. This wine, saving the best for last, according to the unsuspecting father of the bride, the good stuff. Crisis averted. The party goes on. But as mentioned earlier, this moment, this moment was about so much more than Jesus just using his power as Messiah to keep the fun flowing for some, co for some cousin's wedding. Jesus is, in fact, putting us back into the Old Testament, showing that he is the Messiah to come. His first miracle links him with some prophets, some pillars of the Old Testament. Moses' first act was at Moriah, where he sweetens the water in order for God's people to drink it. The very first miracle. 
Elisha, right after Elijah dies, he takes salt and he puts it in the water at Jericho to sweeten the water. His first act, his first miracle. Moses and Elijah sweeten the water, but, but Jesus doesn't just sweeten this water at the wedding. In, in fact, he totally changes it, turning it into wine. It's showing that he's not only going to sweeten things, or he's not only going to do a little bit. Instead, he is going to re-say everything, that he's going to usher in this new kingdom of God. He's not just sweetening the water, he is changing it. This was, as the servants and disciples who witnessed this miracle firsthand, no doubt began to realize who Christ was. They believed in him. This is the inauguration of a whole new celebration that Christ is giving. This was the Savior of the world pressing play on a new era in the kingdom of God and sending a message that which the wine and wedding were a mirror of spiritually and culturally for the Jewish people was now available, tangibly, fully enjoyed for all people, through him, Jesus Christ. It's a truth that has potential to to radically change the we, how we understand Christ, and it changed how people thought about Christ at the wedding. It changes us. It changes us as we live under his gracious, sin-forgiving reign as we go about our daily lives. In our lives, we can easily miss the big picture because we get caught up in the moment. So easy to get wrapped up in the rat race of life. It's one of the reasons why people stop coming to church on Sundays. They got all kinds of stuff going on and they get caught up in all those kinds of things and their faith and worship gets put on the back burner. We get consumed by our day to day. It's easier for, for us to start to define our lives by the mundane. We've got work to do. Bills to pay. We've got to drive here and there. It's tempting to define ourselves by our daily duties and our obligations to see ourselves as the sum of its parts. As we get older, too, it only heightens. The doctor's visits, the bills, just trying to keep one foot in front of each other and trying to roll out of bed. But that's not who we are. If you actually run your life that way, then instead of really living life boldly, you start to to look for escapes to get out of that rat race. You look for escapes to get out of that rut. Maybe if you're listening today, you're looking for that next source of joy to give you a thrill, a little time to get you over the hump. Well, Jesus has better, bigger news than that. If you're, if you're looking for Jesus to be that happy pill that will just kind of overwhelm you as if that's what he, as that's what you need and that's what he's teaching here, you will be disappointed. He doesn't talk that way in this text. We can't miss the point. You might think that our Bible reading today means that faith in Jesus brings life for you right now as a big party. That that's the point of it all, but that's not what he's saying. No, Jesus is showing us that he brings real celebration to life no matter what's happening in your life. He wants to give you a sense of what it means, that he's, of what he's teaching, that he's not coming just to give you a booster shot of celebration for the day. He's giving peace beyond understanding. He's giving forgiveness of sins. Think about this. In him, you are who you are. In him, it's not what's going on in your day-to-day life that defines you, because in him, you are bigger than that. You are stronger than that. Right now, you are not merely someone overwhelmed by your life, not overwhelmed by your preparations. You are not hurt. You're not hurt by a marriage gone awry. You are not just someone who has to go to work every day until that day stops. You are not just a student stuck in classes with people that don't care about you. You are not just a retiree with a life defined by doctor's visits and doctor's bills. You are not even a rich person defined by your material success. You're not a person who is just struggling to pay bills. You are not just somebody that is getting by. You are a person in Christ. And in Christ, you have the promises of life and salvation, and that reality is, and that reality is yours. A promise of real celebration and a real future. You are ultimately defined by Jesus in the midst of your life. His life, 
not yours. His death, not yours. His resurrection, not anything you can do. God came in order to be with you and me, and that is what defines us. That says who we are, now and forever. A good wedding and wedding reception uh, leads to joy. The same is true with Jesus. The forgiveness of sin leads to joy, at, at least it should. Knowing that through the work of the cross, the God who confounds you, who convicts you and is a mystery to you, has now forgiven you and is in love with you, should take the pressure off. The kids may be a mess. The bills are piling up. The work is unfinished. But because of Christ, the only thing that really matters, being right with God, you are reconciled. You are at peace. The Apostle Paul talks about it in this way, too. He himself overwhelmed with this idea. He says in Romans 8, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, if God is really on our side through Jesus Christ, then what could possibly come up that would drag us down? What could possibly separate us from his love? Nothing. Drink that in. Sins forgiven, death conquered. Jesus has filled you with joy. John's point in sharing this miracle at Cana is to tell us that in Christ, the consummation of that promise has come closer than ever, closer than ever before. When we look at the blood of the cross and the emptiness of the tomb, we see more than a reason to be hopeful. We see a guarantee, a guarantee of life. Not just a nostalgic moment. <laughs> We have an undeniable destiny. With this being true, we can aim for so much more than to simply feel hopeful for a moment. We can live hope-filled lives through every storm, every fight, every up and down, and every season of life, knowing that Jesus Christ has fought, won, and guaranteed a glorious, feast-filled future for his people. Feast on that truth. Let out a satisfying sigh of relief because in Christ there is reason to be optimistic about the road ahead. For he is with us. Jesus is God in action for you. He brings real celebration to life, the good news. In fact, it's, it's vitally important because we as sinful human beings have lost the ability to really celebrate, to live life as God created and redeemed us to do. As sinful people, there always comes the time in our life when the wine of life runs out. When sin seeks to detract us and to keep us away from God. People who willfully cut ourselves off from this Lord of life, we often find ourselves drowning in the waters of our despair and guilt. And like this couple, when we need it most, the wine that makes the celebration runs out. But Christ comes. And he gives us what we need, despite our sin. While we were yet sinful, he came and died for us. The Bible is concerned of our sin on every page. It's not as concerned with, with individual sin, but instead they, they, they go even greater, even bigger. They talk about sin as, as a problem for all of humanity that has infected and cursed us all. This overriding reality of sin and death. The reality of sin in our life means that the day is always coming when despite our best efforts and meticulous planning, things will go wrong. The wine of life will run out. The time will come. There is a season. We've all experienced it. But in those times, when that happens, Jesus comes, as he did at the wedding, not just to keep the party going, but instead to give us his peace, his love, and his forgiveness, to give us what we really need. He is there when we are at the end of our rope, when we have nothing left. He is the one who gives. When it comes to what we can do and accomplish, the wine will come out. But when we come to Christ and we receive his gifts, we never reach the bottom of the cup. There is always more to give. For in Christ, no one leaves thirsty. The drink he gives will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. There is abundance of the things that matters for those who have been baptized into his promise and who cling to his cross. 
You want a party of people with whom you can let your hair down and be cared for? God has set up a family of faith across the world, across time, to be unified in the body of Christ. You want riches? Ask your father for forgiveness and see if he ever says no. He doesn't. He always forgives, and those are riches that we really need. You want a blessing? Ask what awaits you at the return of Christ. Look forward to what Christ will redeem and reconcile all things to himself. You want an education? You want wisdom? Flip open his word and dig for his truth. His word never comes back empty. You, my brothers and sisters in Christ, are insanely and incredibly cared and provided for by Jesus. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. I don't know where you are today in life, whatever is going on, but if you're like me, at times when even when things seem to be going well, the wine runs out. The miracle at Cana is telling you and me, especially when we are overwhelmed by the waters of despair, guilt, hopelessness, that in those moments, Jesus comes. Bring him your sins, your struggles, your challenges. He is the Lord who brings real celebration to life, real joy to life, real substance to life, real hope for today and tomorrow forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.